Um, so I'm going to get underway. I'm Kevin Fong. I am an anaesthetist at University College London Hospital. I apologise for my poor state of dress today. Um, I'm doing the other half of my job, which is public engagement today, so we're busy making a very short turnaround documentary for Eyes and about the recent cyber attacks. Um, so this is television uniform as opposed to anaesthetic uniform. Um, I, I wanted to talk to you about anaesthesia in space today, and really because uh, this has been my passion really since I've been a qualified doctor and certainly that's been supported through my time as an anaesthetist. Uh, my colleagues at University College have uh, very much supported my exploration of this particular part of the world. Um, this is me on my <laughs> medical elective uh, 25 years ago. Uh, I was also at UCL for my medical school. I had studied astrophysics um, before I went to medical school. Um, and mainly because I didn't know what I wanted to do at the time and uh, the University College Applications Handbook is alphabetical. Um, and so, so, so I went and studied astrophysics and then went into medicine. I worked with NASA um, for a while with medical, medical Operations Group and then with their Human Adaptation and uh, Countermeasures Office at Johnson Space Center in Houston. Uh, and out of that developed this sort of uh, interest in exploring the extremes but particularly exploring space. Uh, now, uh, the effects of space on the human body are widespread. That's what we know from studying the human body over half a century in space. And it affects your muscle, your bone, uh, um, your sense of balance and coordination. Uh, your heart itself is a muscle pump, and so it atrophies, and the systems of vessels around it atrophy uh, with prolonged duration in space. And the message through our examination of human physiology in space is very clear that the impacts are widespread and the deeper we look, the further those impacts go. Now, for a while, with the advent of missions aboard the International Space Station at the start of the 21st century, we thought we had it licked. We thought, okay, there are profound impacts on the human body, muscle, bone, cardiovascular, respiratory, the brain, but we kind of got it licked. And then, very recently, there were a new set of problems that we were discovering with raised intracranial pressure, which was sufficient to cause a um, bit of swelling and a bit of uh, uh, deformation of the eyeball, which was affecting the eyesight of our astronauts both on mission and afterwards. So the story is not over yet. There's still a long way to go. Um, but we'll talk a little bit more about the problems of keeping astronauts healthy in space later. It's easier if I take you through the challenges of what is now the current era of space exploration. Now, we're familiar with this idea that we are currently in the space age, but really there are, there are two space ages. There is the first space age, which is the thing that made the space age famous and our conquest of the moon and low Earth orbit, and then there's the second space age. But let's talk about the first space age to start with. Starts here with the Russians, of course, and their successful mission with Yuri Gagarin in 1961, uh, manning a full orbit of the Earth uh, in a, a very fraught mission. But nevertheless, this is the beginning of our endeavour in human spaceflight. So 1961. Uh, the reply to that comes from uh, the United States in the form of the Mercury 7. And at this point, the Americans are far behind in the race for space. Uh, they are able to provide Alan Shepard, who, who manages only a suborbital flight. So he goes up, he doesn't go all the way around the Earth, and he comes back down again. And then John Glenn finally manages to come and match the Russians with his first orbital flight. But at this time, human space exploration is just a surrogate battlefield for a war that can't be fought in any other way. This is the nuclear war played out in human space exploration, and the message is clear. If you have a rocket, rocket technology that can loft a 80, 90 kilogram man into space and get them back again, you can do the same with a warhead. And that's what this is all about. And so it's not surprising that the first astronauts uh, the, the, the first astronauts are the Knights of the Cold War because they've been literally plucked out of their fighter aircraft and put into the new battlefield. The first space age, though, climaxes here, of course, with uh, Project Apollo. And this is where the United States surge ahead and managed to show their technological preeminence in this field. This is a very beautiful picture of Saturn V headed for the moon in the summer of 69. Uh, this is a vehicle with the explosive capacity of a small nuclear weapon that goes from naught to 25,000 miles an hour and delivers a crew of three to an object that's a quarter of a million miles away in space. And that's all done before this decade is out, having the challenge having been announced in 1962. That's quite impressive. 
This, one of my favourite photographs in all of human space exploration, is not Apollo 11, actually, it's Apollo 15, landing on the Hadley Rill. It's the first of the missions which saw us deploy lunar rovers and so extend our presence in space. All of that required that same exploration that took us out, also made us look in towards ourselves and examine our own physiology uh, and try to better understand the impacts upon it. And space, like all other extreme environments, although on camera it looks like fun, looks like a sort of luxury airline flight with the added fun of floating around, is like any other of the extremes, uh, walking to the pole, into our deserts, onto our mountains. We can't do it for long and we can't do it without penalty. Uh, and on top of all the impacts of weightlessness, which we've already started this talk discussing, there's also the problem of radiation, particularly once you move outside of the Earth's low, or Earth's low orbit, where you're protected by the Earth's magnetic field. But that's not all. The people we chose to fly in space in the first space age were chosen to be optimally fit. It was a very good job to be a space doctor back then because your patients were amongst the fittest people in the country that you lived in and basically either all the engineering worked and they all lived or it didn't and everybody died and there was really nothing in between. And that's a gross oversimplification, but that was really the story of the first space age. Prevention was better than cure, intervention was limited, and you relied upon the engineers to keep your crews safe, broadly speaking, while you went about the job of exploring physiology to understand what lay in store for the future. But that was the first space age, and the space age does not look like that anymore. This is the second space age, commercialization of access to low Earth orbit. Now, I was working at NASA around about the start of the 21st century uh, when they started to say that commercial companies were going to play a role in human space exploration and I absolutely thought that that would never happen and I was proved wrong within a handful of years actually um, uh, and now we have the ingress of the commercial providers and this in 2001 is Dennis Tito the world's first commercial space participant some say space tourist but actually that, that, that kind of denigrates their role. They have to do all the training, they have to survive it, and he's a dot-com billionaire who has decided to buy himself a seat on a Soyuz capsule and go into space. And so now you have the beginning of an era where uh, independently wealthy individuals can buy their way into space. This is a very different population from these people medically. I mean, medically, we have nothing to offer these people. These people are in their prime, and are, not only are they unlikely to get sick on mission, but, um, but by any assessment of their excise capacity, they are superlative individuals. So they are unlikely to get unexpectedly ill. Uh, this is John Glenn, who amongst that cohort was amongst the, uh, the healthiest of all of them. Uh, and, and there's a story about the fact that he always used to be running up and down Cocoa Beach, keeping himself fit, Armstrong, Neil Armstrong, was less keen on the exercise and someone asked Armstrong why he wasn't also running up and down the beach and he said I, I believe God gave you a finite number of heartbeats and I'm damned if I'm going to wear them out on that beach um, but but indeed you know John, John Glenn was very healthy into very very late age. I was very lucky when I was at NASA in 1998 uh, John Glenn returned to space at the age of 77 on STS-95 and that gave us all pause for thought. That was my elective project, was to try and cross-reference the database of the effects of ageing on the human body with the effects of uh, uh, weightlessness uh, and to see if there were likely to be any surprises in store. And of course, this is an impossible task to do. There was a large team of people who were involved in it and I had a small contribution to that. Nevertheless, they managed to get a 77-year-old man into space and although he was chronologically 77, physiologically he was probably much younger, but it was still a great challenge to get him up there. But this began to expand the envelope of the type of person he would send to space. No longer was it just people in their mid-40s in great physical condition. It wasn't just chronology we extended, we also extended uh, pathology. Amongst the space participants that followed Dennis Tito into space, there were some people who were frankly <coughs> quite unwell. This is one of them uh, who was very kind enough to give his medical data to the uh, wider space medicine community. Um, uh, and, and 
you know, even to a medical student, this x-ray looks like a hyperinflated emph emphysematous pair of lungs. This is the pair of lungs of someone who's spent a lot of their life smoking. Uh, uh, there are areas of uh, bullae here, so small air-trapped spaces within the lungs that are, again, uh, effectively uh, the, the symbol of diseased lungs, uh, diseased by smoking. Now, here you have someone who would get washed out of the first screening in any formal astronaut selection, but it, who, as a space participant, could be qualified for flight with careful intervention from his physician, uh, a chap called Richard Jennings, who's you know, the preeminent space participant uh, flight physician. Uh, and he went about helping this man qualify for space, uh, and that included uh, ablation, um, uh, uh, ablation um, physiology for his heart to correct an arrhythmia. His heart was beating irregularly. Uh, a pleurodesis of his lungs because he was developing pneumothoraces, so he had repeated collapsed lungs. So again, the person I'm describing here is the sort of person who, to an anaesthetist, you would wonder, to think twice about giving them an anaesthetic, let alone firing them into space. And yet this person flew into space very successfully and was uh, successful as a participant up there. But this is the, the age in which we live now. The envelope of people who fly in space is getting older and uh, we're seeing much more in the way of disease in that population. And if our dreams of commercialization are truly to be realized, then, then we're going to have to understand how to do that properly. So suddenly spaceflight and the <coughs> role of the physician in spaceflight becomes different. It's no longer looking at a bunch of very fit individuals and worrying about whether or not we can mitigate their problems if they have an emergency. It's about can we keep them healthy? Can we mitigate the problems that they have because of their existing morbidity, their existing diseases? And, and can we make this as, as accessible to as wide an audience as possible? Um, which brings it really much close to the realms of what the job of an anaesthetist is like anyway, on any given day. You look at someone who has a range of diseases, chronic and recent, and you wonder whether or not they can tolerate this relatively strenuous physiological stressor um, uh, for some perceived benefit, in that case medical, in this case, well, for some experience. Uh, and so it, it, it's, it, it bizarrely becomes something that falls well within the anaesthetic skill set. Now all of this leads you to wonder where we're all going with it. And the next other problem that we have is where we want to go. We want to take us out uh, and go further than the moon. The moon sits there at a quarter of a million miles. A and when you think about this, this is 1969, and we take for granted this is ancient history, and most of us uh, believe that this happened, uh, and, 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 and that it was an amazing thing, but it was a long time ago, and we kind of are able to do that now. But think about where we were in the 20th century before that. This is 1912. This is Scott's po South Polar team, all of whom, of course, died on their way marching back from the South Pole. 1912, so basically just a little over half a century before that. 53, so the start of the 20th century is important to constantly remind ourselves that there were still places in the map of the world where no human foot had ever trodden. And that included the South Pole, and that included the polar, uh, that included the summits of our highest mountains, and here, of course, Everest in 1953. That photograph at the bottom is taken from shuttle of Everest from low Earth orbit. So this is the limit of our ability to protect human life as we march through the 20th century. So the South Pole, then in the middle of the 20th century, the summit of Everest, uh, and then there by 1969. So that pace of advance is rapid, and it all depends upon us building the right protective technology. This is a partnership between technology, science, medical know-how, and physiology. Uh, and again, this is sort of a metaphor for the way we pushed forwards in modern medicine in the 20th century and certainly in anaesthesia. This is the object of our exploration ambition today. This is 2017. This is little more than 100 years after Scott and his team perished on the march back from the South Pole. This is Victoria Crater. It is located on Mars. And this is a very beautiful picture taken by the Mars Orbital Camera uh, um, uh, and, and this is Victoria Crater. Victoria Crater named after the flagship of Ferdinand Magellan's uh, uh, circumnavigation of the globe. Uh, and if you look really hard in one of the corners around about the 11 o'clock position, there's a little dot, and that dot is one of the Mars exploration rovers. This location 
So if you remember, the moon is at a quarter of a million miles distance. This location, depending on when you choose to go, will be hundreds of millions of interplanetary miles away with communication delays of up to 20 minutes in each direction when you're trying to phone home uh, with you um, a good year and a half from the nearest GP appointment, uh, which doesn't sound so bad some places, I think. But uh, uh, this is where we want to go. And it's unclear exactly how we get there. Kennedy was very clear on the moon before the decade is out. We're not so sure now. This, though, is Elon Musk, who probably has the best idea. He is a dot-com billionaire, another one he made his money out of PayPal. And then he built uh, the Tesla motor car company, or at least he took on the Tesla motor car company because he thought that he was able to make electric cars better than anyone else because he was cleverer than anyone else. And he turned out to be right about that. And then he thought, well, I can build rockets better than anyone else. I can build rockets better than NASA in my own garage. Uh, and he turned out to be right about that as well, only he's got a much better garage than you do. This is his, his garage. This is one of the Falcon uh, 9 rockets. And uh, this has been a remarkable to see his march and progress with technology. He built rockets that rendezvoused with the space station. So he's a privateer who built a private company that built rockets that rendezvoused with $100 billion bits of state-funded hardware. This is uh, uh, one of his latest first stage rockets that this isn't taking off in this picture, it's landing. So this is a first stage rocket that takes off, launches its payload, and then lands vertically on this thing, which is a robotic barge that's floating in the Atlantic Ocean. Now all of this stuff looks quite sci-fi when you watch it, but it's real and he's making it happen. Now he hasn't had unbridled success, he has had some accidents, and, in, and he's a very confident individual, but even here in, in this, this famous tweet, he says uh, uh, after he'd lost one of his rockets, he says rockets are tricky, which is an understatement by any means. But nevertheless, he's the one to watch when you wonder what the shape of the second space age is really going to turn out to be. This last thought then before we close, and that is to say that this is Ferdinand Magellan's expedition. Five ships, 283 sailors, circumnavigating the globe between 1519 and uh, 1522. Magellan perishes on the expedition. Of those five ships, they lose four of them en route. One ship, the Victoria, after which that crater on Mars is named, remains, and it has 18 sailors aboard when it returns. Four centuries later, this is the Terra Nova, this is Scott's ship of discovery, and you know that Magellan would have understood almost immediately what that was. He would have said, that is a state-of-the-art ship of exploration. I see it, I understand it, I know what it is. And yet, within just about 50-odd years of this, this is the state of the art in our ships of exploration. This is how far we move in the 20th century in a few short decades. When we get onto the moon, and that is far from the limit of our ambitions. It's my favorite photo in all of space exploration. This is the prototype space shuttle being towed through the deserts of California. And this is the speed at which the future used to arrive. It used to arrive driven by NASA on the back of a flatbed truck at about five to 10 miles an hour and you used to just get used to it as it was arriving in the distance. Today, the future arrives at the speed of light down fiber optic broadband, uh, and it's much harder to, to acclimatize to. Um, this is the prototype Space Shuttle Enterprise, actually in, in, uh, in low Earth orbit testing. Uh, and so it never flew into spaces, but uh, was renamed uh, the Starship Enterprise by the, um, by the fans of the series. Um, this finally is where we are today, and this is where I'm going to leave it. This is the International Space Station. Now, you think you take the International Space Station somewhat for granted because it's there and people are aboard it, and you don't think of it very much. But since it crewed up at the start of the 20th, 21st century, there has never not been a person in space. So we permanently inhabit space now. That is our state of being. Um, and it is an enormous achievement. It's an enormous achievement to keep it there and it's been an enormous laboratory to study the human body. And it is this knowledge, this constant process of pushing the boundaries and looking out, and at the same time looking in and exploring ourselves that allows us to push forwards. I'm gonna finish with this last note, that is to say that when I started in this um, about 20 years ago, the UK was not part of the International Space Station. We had no space agency. Uh, we had no space medicine. 
Uh, there was no career path for anyone who wanted to pursue a career in space medicine. And now we have a space agency. We have a flown British astronaut in Tim Peake. We are a member of the International Space Station. And I'm very pleased to say that through the efforts of my colleagues in aviation and space medicine, you can now CCT in aviation and space medicine. Uh, and our first trainees are going through right now. So that is the future. Uh, and this is the second space age. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you.